Okay, module number seven, which is really chapter number eight in CIS 76. We have one more lecture after this, and then we throw our focus into the pen test plus learning path in preparation for the pen test plus exam. As always, we have a do I know this? This short chapter is about maintaining persistence, which is really being able to get back at the machine at a later time. So you've spent all your time doing research on your target. You enumerated, figured out what ports are open, figured out what services are running, figured out version numbers, figured out possible CVEs, crafted your payload. You were you sent the payload on its way. Either it was triggered automatically or triggered by a user. The exploit occurred. You get a shell. That's great, but that's not the whole point of the game. Doing things like that is great. And you practice that a lot in uh, places like Hack the Box which is a very useful place to, to learn that skill of getting into machines or pwning them. That's not the end of everything. You still have to maintain persistence. With a shell, an attacker can open a port or listen on the compromised system and wait for connections. This is done in order to connect to the victim from any system and execute commands and further manipulate the victim. This all tends to happen undetected if the attacker does it right. One of the most common tools that is used to do this is Netcat. In this example, Netcat is run, uh, listening on port 1234, executing a bash shell or a command prompt. On the attacker side, they would run something like this in order to access that listening port. The thing is Netcat is known. It is well documented. If the victim is well organized, has fine tuned their intrusion detection systems, has a good Splunk setup, for example, then it will be hard for an attacker to successfully maintain persistence in a system because things like a odd port opening up is going to appear. And they should take appropriate action to realize that this is an attack, a successful attack that occurred, and now a persistence is uh, being attempted. This is a reverse shell, where an attacker has a listener, uh, has a port open, and the victim initiates a connection back to the attacking system. This is the easier way for an attacker to circumvent firewalls. So again, a well-organized uh, company, well-organized IT department, will normally have a strong firewall in place that blocks everything except the necessary ports. And normally that blockage is incoming. So anything that is not on the approved list of ports coming into the network is usually blocked. But the reverse is not so true. The reverse is normally assumed to be OK because a machine from the inside is initiating a connection out. If an attacker is able to get a reverse shell and there is no proper logging, no proper checking of open ports, no proper uh, uh, no, just man, uh, network management, 
this will be able to get through. It becomes even harder when the port isn't something like 666, but is something like 443. Attackers like to use command and control utilities or C2 systems to send commands and instructions to compromised systems. It just makes life easier. Attackers often use virtual machines or cloud services, including Twitter, Dropbox, Photobucket, and, and pretty much anything else they can get their hands on. The C2 communication can be as simple as maintaining a timed beacon or a heartbeat to launch additional attacks for data exfiltration. Again, this becomes a little harder to detect and stop. Especially if a company is using social media, for example, to get the word out, to do their marketing stuff, IT will have to open things like Twitter and Instagram and whatnot available to the world. If it's possible for an attacker to use those same platforms to make their a command and control centers, then they could, upon infecting, make a persistent connection back that flows undetected with the regular traffic. In the notes, I gave you some publicly available C2 systems that are on GitHub. Have fun with those. Try them out. Another place that attackers like to hide their persistence is in cron jobs or scheduled tasks. It tends to be that, that these things have system level privileges. So if an attacker is able to create these, then they'll be able to get root or admin access whenever they want, like when the computer restarts. Attackers can and normally will use the better practices of like uh, making alternate accounts with complex passwords in order to hide from uh, being detected. So as an attacker, you have, if you follow the best practices, you have better chance of hiding in plain sight. Once an attacker is successfully exploited a system and is able to connect to it whenever they please through this persistence, then, become, then the next step is lateral movement. Moving from that compromised system to another. This is why anything that faces out to the internet and is on our on-premise or in the cloud should be highly logged, highly uh, uh, modified and secured and constantly checked because any successful attack to those systems means that any other system on that same network will, will be next the next target because that's the typical process is after gaining a beachhead on one, setting up camp with persistence, they'll move on to the next. And if they were able to get admin credentials, then they'll use those credentials on the other systems because more likely than not, when they move from one system to the next, they'll have the same credentials. Again, having strong logging, having strong management will be able to detect. It won't be able to stop because attackers will, will succeed in one way or another. But at least detection will be there. So detecting things that are uncommon, not on your network, or uh, things that just like RDP, Apple Remote Desktop, VNC, or X server, whenever things like that are being forwarded, or the shell, whenever those things are being forwarded outside the network, those should be reported. because those would be the, the defaults that an attacker would use to get 
into that system to get persistence and move laterally from one box to the next. Now, things like, for example, in PowerShell, things like get child item or copy item, move item, in and of themselves is not at all malicious. Since when is listing directories in a folder malicious? You do that all the time with your home computer. or copying files, you do that all the time. Moving files, searching for files. Right, that's all common things. Those same things can be used for malicious purposes. So again, detecting commands on the line, detecting commands that are getting outside of the norm would be the key in finding things like this out. Because these tools, like get child item, while they are completely void of things like a buffer overflow, they can yield very useful information for an attacker who's trying to exfiltrate data. So as an attacker, you could totally live off the land using commands that are native to the environment to get the information that you need out. Thinking defensively, if your organization doesn't use a lot of PowerShell, then detecting PowerShell commands being executed would be a great way to signal, hey, there's something wrong on the network. Something's up. Oh, and to the question in chat, yes, cron jobs are exactly background processes. That's exactly what they are. I have linked a tool called PowerSploit. It's a collection of PowerShell modules that can be used to aid penetration testers during all phases of an assessment. Empire is another tool that does similar things to PowerSploit. I highly suggest looking at both and playing with both on a Windows system. See which one you like, see which one to add to your toolbox and practice them against Windows boxes that you make in the cloud or on places like Hack the Box, Root Me, or Try Hack Me. Continuing in the uh, living off the land, you have the Windows Management Instrumentation, which allows scripts or apps to automate administrative tasks on remote systems. It's already built into Windows. You just have to exploit it. So if you know how to use it, you could totally take advantage. Another suite of tools that can help you as an attacker to control Windows remotely, to upload and execute and interact with other executables on hosts. This set of tools can be command lined and can be scripted. I'm talking about sysinternals. Sysinternals is an awesome set, awesome suite that was bought by Microsoft a couple of years ago, whose purpose is to help administrators handle a Windows system, like th during things like incidents, during troubleshooting, that kind of stuff. For example, PS exec can bring out all the executables that are running. Uh, you can get the SID of users logged in. Uh, you can do all kinds of things like uh, change passwords, suspend, shut down, uh, 
deep log management, all that kind of stuff using these very little tools that are super useful. There's also a book that I would suggest if you are very curious and want to learn about uh, Citizen Turtles. It's called Troubleshooting with the Windows to Citizen Turtles Tools uh, by the guy who made those tools, Mark uh, Rustinovich. It gives you an in-depth anal analysis on how to use all the tools that, that the entire suite has. And honestly, it's just playing with the tools and realizing how evil you can get with them. Because these tools won't be bought by Microsoft. They're Microsoft tools. They're legitimate. The use of it can be a little more black or white or yeah, more gray. Just like with PowerShell. These commands are not meant to be used in a negative fashion, but you can. Now, speaking of a pen test engagement, during it, you should cover your tracks and avoid detection like a real attacker would. But when it's all over, make sure that you delete accounts that you created, any files that you created, uh, remove the tools that you used because it's a pen test engagement and you want to be able to restore the system back to its previous state and be able to well document everything you did so that the client is able to replicate themselves using the same tools and see your findings and take actions on those findings. Which means you should practice. Go ahead and hack systems. Use places like root me, hack the box and try hack me. Create your own in the cloud and practice. Practice both using these tools to get uh, access to the system, create your persistence, and then reverse the whole thing. You want to be able to know how to set your tools up and how to tear them down in a safe way that doesn't harm the client. So if you're thinking of using sysinternals tools as part of your pen test engagement, that's perfectly fine. Go ahead. I highly encourage you to. But I also encourage you to uh, test and see how you would both put the tool in place, use it, and remove it along with any other data that it generated. Because when you do this for real as a profession, you want to be able to know exactly what to do to clean up. That is a professional move. That is a good thing to do. So play with tools like PowerSploit and Empire. Test them out, use them to your heart's content, and also learn how to remove them and reset the system back so that the client will be happy. Any questions or other questions? So the work this week is to find five try hack me rooms based on these topics. In this example here, I typed the word post and here are actually three examples, post exploitation basics, empire and persistence that could easily count for three of your five rooms in this subject. As usual, jump into the room, do the uh, complete the room, 
and submit proof of completion. That way it's not just you heard me talk about it, but you actually have some hands-on experience with a certificate of proof that you can continue to add to your resume, continue to add to your profile as you are building up that experience, you're building up that knowledge base in a tangible way that an employer can see. And as always, feel free to work together and chat on Discord. And feel free to ask any questions on Discord.